First Corinthians. We've been going through this now. We're going to be in a couple of passages here in chapter 10, and then also one in chapter 11. In uh, the 1800s, there was a, a thing that was going on that was today we would really kind of look at as kind of strange. As a matter of fact, if you ever see it, you'll think it's kind of strange. Uh, first time I ever saw it was a, a thing on the internet. Somehow it popped up someplace and just about, well, what is this all about? So I started looking at it. And what it is, is these people uh, who were taking family pictures in the 1800s, they're taking family pictures. But what was odd about it is that one of the people in the picture was dead. Yeah. They would take pictures with their loved one who had died. Yeah. Yeah. That seems really odd to us, all right? But here's the thing we have to remember. They probably had no pictures of this person other than that one. And so when somebody dies, sometimes they think, we need to get a picture before we bury this person so we can remember them. Especially children. I mean, there are a lot of pictures of children, babies, and, and young children because the infant mortality rate, children mortality rate was very high. And they didn't want to forget what this person looked like. And so they would get a photographer to come and take <coughs> pictures of them with their loved one. And a lot of times it was looked like the person was just there but if you look closely you can tell they are now they're dead but you know they took a regular family picture with them sitting there in a chair or the mother holding the baby or whatever and it seems like a really strange and creepy thing to us but to the people at that time it was a real comfort it really gave them some comfort today we do some things too to kind of remember those who we've lost you know, people sometimes will keep the ashes of their loved one and they'll put it on a, on a mantle or in a, a place of honor on a table or something. Uh, they might keep a lock of their hair in a locket. They might um, take their pictures and put it in a very prominent place. Even set a place for them at family dinners. I've heard of people doing that. And so people just, they want to remember those who have gone, who have, who have passed on. Before Jesus died, he set up a way for us to remember him. We refer to, to it today as the Lord's Supper, or sometimes we call it communion. And there are some others call it the Eucharist, which uh, is from the Greek, which means Thanksgiving. Some celebrate it as we do weekly. Others do it monthly. Some do it quarterly. And uh, some do it very seldom. But, you know, some pass it as we do. You know, they take, as they pass along, they take it as it comes and they take it. Others hold on to it and take it together. Some come up to the front of the church and take it. And none of these ways are right or wrong. They're just different. But in today's passage of God's Word, we're going to find out that there is a right and a wrong way to take the Word's Supper. And I think this is a very important thing for us to understand and uh, because it can be, I think, dangerous to take it the wrong way. Okay. So we're going to read, and we're going to read first of all in First uh, Corinthians chapter ten, verse fourteen to twenty-two. We read that last week, but I want to go back to it again this week. And then we're going to skip over to chapter eleven, verses seventeen through uh, the end of the chapter there. And so this is what it says: it "says Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry." I speak to sensible people, judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifice participate in the altar? Do I mean then that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? And then we're going to skip over here to chapter 11, verse 17. It says this. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. No doubt there has to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, 
For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from, for what I for I received from the Lord what I have also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the same, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are, sick, are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined, so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further direction. Okay, hey, Paul gives some pretty strong warnings there about communion. Some things I think that we need to understand because we do take it every week. And, and sometimes people, other churches, <coughs> other groups look at us and think, you know, you do it every week. That just makes it become a habit, a ritual, and it doesn't really mean anything. And the thing is, they can be right. Okay. Sometimes it can become just something that we do. And, and you know, so we, we take the... Uh, the bread will pass along, we take it real quick, we put it in our mouth and chew it up and eat it, and then we start thinking about all kinds of other things. We take the cup and drink it real quick, and, and it just goes on, and it just really doesn't mean anything to us if we're not careful. But at the same time, we can take it every week, and it becomes something very, very meaningful to us, and an important thing, an important part of our worship service, if we will make it that. But it means each of us needs to take care of that. So... There's some things I think that we learn in this passage that I think that we need to understand about the Lord's Supper. And that will help us to make it more meaningful, to make it something that really has an impact on our spiritual life. And so here's the three things I think that we need to do, that we need to remember. First, the Lord's Supper is a time to remember Jesus. Okay? The Lord's Supper is a time to remember Jesus. When we start passing it out, it's not a time to be worrying about what UK is going to do. Of course, sorry, but they're not playing today. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, I really am. Just had <laughs> But I've been told they were, we need to be sure we're having time. But anyhow. <laughs> but uh, we don't have to worry about that today. But the thing is, we don't need to think about that or, or about what we're going to have for lunch or this thing or that thing. What we need to focus in is on Jesus Christ. We need to focus on who He is. We need to focus on what he did, and we need to focus on what he is doing and what he will do. Look at verses 11 and verse 23 and through 26. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, it's a time to remember him. We need to remember that he is Lord. Right? That's one of the things that said, that he is Lord. And uh, we need to remember that, that he is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. He is the one who came to give us a way to the Father. So we need to remember that. We need to remember that he died, was buried, and raised to life. As we take the Lord's Supper, we need to think about his death on the cross. And sometimes, you know, I visualize that to just remind myself what he went through for my sin. We need to remember that he is interceding for us now. 
In 1 Timothy 5, uh, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, it says this, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Get that? Means there's one mediator. Christ is standing up for you and me. He's between us and God, setting things right, making things right for us so that we can have that relationship with our Heavenly Father. And so he's interceding for us at this very moment. And we need to remember that he's doing that for us. And then we also need to remember that he's coming again. That he is going to return. And we don't know when that is. I think we need to live, live every day as if this is the last day. Every day. Well, I think we still have a kind of our mind that, well, that's a ways off. You know, I haven't seen all the signs of the second coming. We need to live every day because guess what? Christ might not return physically, but we might go to him. And so it may be our last day. And we need to live every day that way. In Acts chapter 1, 9 to 11, it says, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. This is uh, right after he died and, and it was with his disciples. He says, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and the cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who, you, who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And so one day he's going to return. We don't know when that's going to be. But as we take the Lord's Supper, we might remember what he said, that he would drink it again with us in the kingdom. When he comes back in his kingdom. And so we need to remember Jesus. This needs to be our, our key focal point, is to remember Jesus during this time. But then there's something else that we need to make sure that we do. And that is the Lord's Supper is a reminder to examine ourselves. The Lord's Supper is a reminder to examine ourselves. When we start taking the Lord's Supper, we need to look at ourselves. And one of the things I like about doing it every week is it gives us a chance to, if we haven't done it, which I think we ought to do it every day, but at least when we come here around the Lord's and his book, we take the Lord's Supper, it's a time for us just to kind of look back over the week and think about what we've done right and, more importantly, what we've done wrong. There's a man by the name of Andrus Tomas. I mean, he had been drafted in the army, but the authorities mistook his native Hungarian language for the gibberish of a lunatic. <laughs> and so they had him committed to a psychiatric hospital in Russia. And then they forgot about him for 53 years. Several years ago, a doctor began to realize what had happened and helped Tomas recover the memories of who he was and where he'd come from. And he was returned home to Budapest as the last prisoner of World War II. This old man hadn't seen his own face in five decades. And so for hours, the old man studied his face in the mirror. The deep set eyes, the gray stubble on his chin, the furrows on his brow. It was his face, but what a startling revelation to see it after 53 years. Imagine it. Looking at your own face in the mirror and not recognizing you. See, that's what we need to do when we take the Lord's Supper. We need to look at ourselves, to examine ourselves. James in chapter 1, verses 22 to 25, this is from the Bible Read Version, said, Do what God's teaching says. Don't just listen and do nothing. When you only sit and listen, you are fooling yourselves. Hearing God's teaching and doing nothing is like looking at your face in the mirror and doing nothing about what you saw. You go away and immediately forget how bad you looked. For when you look into God's perfect law that sets people free, pay attention to it. If you do what it says, you will have God's blessing. Never just listen to his teaching and forget what you've heard. Right? That's what we need to do is when we come to the Lord's table, we need to look at ourselves and examine ourselves and think, how have I lived out God's word this way? Are there things where I have failed to, to live up to it? Where I've done what I know wasn't right? Or maybe things that I've just failed to do that I knew were, were right? How am I living my life? And we need to examine ourselves and look at ourselves. Jesus said that when we come to worship, when we come to worship God, that we need to make sure about that. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24, he says this. So what if you are offering your gift at the altar 
And remember that someone is something against you. Lead your gift there and go and make peace with that person. Then come and offer your gift. You know, not only should we examine ourselves, but we also want to examine how our relationships are with other people. Are there people that we need to forgive? Are there people that we need to go to and apologize to? We need to be thinking about these things when we take the Lord's Supper. We need to examine ourselves. And then the third thing I think that we need to do is that the Lord's Supper is a reminder that we are one. That we are one body. Look what it said in chapter 10, verse 17 again. It says, Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Now, I'll admit that the way that we take the bread, maybe it doesn't really give us that kind of an idea. Maybe we ought to change it. I don't know. But we have a little individual things. But guess what? We're still looking at as one loaf, the body of Christ. And what he says is that when we participate in it, when we share it, we are one body. One body. You see, the problem in the church at Corinth was that they celebrated the Lord's Supper in conjunction with what they called a love feast. And today they would call it a fellowship dinner. Okay? They would get together and they would eat, and while they ate, they would take some time to share the bread and the cup. But here's what was going on. There were some who were wealthier, in the church, who were bringing lots of food, and they would get together with the other wealthy people, and kind of share it back and forth, and, and enjoy it. But then there were other people who were poor, very possibly slaves, who came with nothing. They had nothing to bring, and they would come in, and, and maybe they came in late because it talks about they didn't wait for people, and so they maybe even had to come in late because they were still working and had to get there. And when they came in, they saw all these other people eating. They weren't invited. They weren't part of that. And, and so there was some division going on. And that's one thing that we kind of see in the church this morning. So much division over different things. But here they were together. And they weren't sharing with one another. And yet they came together then to take the Lord's Supper. To share the bread and the cup. And Paul says, that's not good. You can't come together and be one. With, with just the, with this, without being united <coughs> in other things. So the Lord's Supper should bring us to remember that we are one, because we are. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all in need of a Savior, and that's and that we who have accepted the gift Jesus provided, that we are remembering during the Lord's Supper. That we are now family. It doesn't matter you know, where we came from. It doesn't matter where our, what our financial status is. It doesn't matter. Any of that doesn't matter. We must not let anything divide us. In Galatians 6, 3, I'm sorry, 26 and 28, it says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Listen to this part. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There's neither male and female, for you are all one. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so when we come together around this Lord's table, we are one. We are all in the same boat. We are all sinners saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. There's nothing different about us. So we need to remember that. You see, too often I think we allow the Lord's Supper to mean too little to us. We allow ourselves to be distracted, maybe even bored while we're taking it. We turn our attention to other things. And what does that say about our gratitude for what Christ suffered on the cross on our behalf? When we do so, we are in danger of bringing judgment on ourselves. When we take the Lord's Supper very flippantly, when we just kind of take it and pass it on and don't think anything more about it, we are in danger of bringing judgment on ourselves. Read, notice what it says again in verse uh, 11, I mean, third of chapter 11. It says this. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. You know, I think he means 
possibly physically, but also <coughs> spiritually. You know, when we don't take the Lord's Supper in the right manner, when we are inappropriately taking it, when we haven't looked at ourselves and taken it in a worthy manner for what Christ has done for us, we are in danger of becoming weak and sick and even says to fall asleep. That's dangerous to me. Sounds dangerous. Not to me. So when we take the Lord's Supper each week, it needs to be, it doesn't need to be, it must be something special. It needs to be a moment where we remember Christ, where we examine ourselves, and we realize that we are one body of Christ. And not just one with the people here in this building, but one with Christians all over the world. We are one. One body. And we need to stay together because there's a world out there that's one that tears apart. And so we've got to remain one. Let's not, let's not let that happen. Let's not let each week be a time when we just start flipping about the Lord's Supper. May each week, may it be, may the Lord's Supper become a central and significant part of our worship <coughs> service. Something that really brings us closer to God and closer to one another. I think that's why we call it communion. To commune with God, to commune with one another. To bring us together as one. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you so much for this time in our service where we can remember what Christ did for us. Father, we know we're all sinners. We know that we don't deserve what he did, but you loved us so much and you showed that. You demonstrated it through what Christ did. And so as we take this over, may it always remind us of that sacrifice. But Father, may we look at ourselves each week. Each time we take it, Father, may we examine ourselves in our heart and see the things that we need to, to get rid of and see what things we need to put on so that we might be dressed appropriately in your presence. And Father God, help us to remember that we're all one, that we are to love each other and be one in Christ. Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this, this ceremony of, of remembrance. This time to remember all that you have done for us. May we never take it for granted. May we never make it something that is just a small part. But instead, Father, make it a significant part of who we are in your presence. So help us, Father, to always take it appropriately. In Jesus' name we pray. <laughs> Amen.